monster seminar day. So I'm going to give a talk about bounding L functions of uh, character twists. So pi will be a fixed um, cusp form on, let's say, GL R of uh, Z. And chi will be a Dirichlet character. Some conductor going off to infinity. And so we can attach this function. I'll call it uh, L pi tensor chi uh, s, uh, which will satisfy, among other properties, a functional equation <clears throat> under the substitution s goes to 1 minus s that looks something like this. So epsilon chi will be a, a Gauss sum raised to some power. Uh, gamma s will be some local gamma function, which will be unimportant for us. And then we'll have the dual L function on this side. <clears throat> the problem will be to um, bound it at the center. <clears throat> So I got interested in this problem a bit indirectly. There are many methods one can use to attack these problems, some of them a couple decades old, and which have been well understood now in some sense. But there have been some more recent methods to attack some cases of this problem that I think are very imperfectly understood and have in the past couple of years been applied to other problems I was interested in in somewhat spectacular fashion. So this motivated me to look back at this question in some cases and to try to understand those methods a bit better. And I'll state some results which represent possibly some progress towards understanding those methods uh, with a lot, lot of work, I think, left to be done to achieve a real understanding. So there's um, a standard set of nomenclature concerning the bounds one knows and expects and hopes to prove for these uh, objects. <clears throat> so the convexity or trivial bound says in this case that this number is bounded by some constant multiple of uh, q to the r over 4 plus a small positive constant. <clears throat> we want to prove the so-called subconvex bound <clears throat> which I'll call star, which is the same thing but with a slightly smaller exponent. And there's some history on this problem. So there's the, so, so this won't be a, a survey lecture on the subconvexity problem. I'll just talk about this one aspect. So in the case r equal 1, where um, pi is the, uh, the trivial representation, and this is just the Dirichlet L function, this, um, this goes back to, uh, to Burgess um, in, I think, 1963. So, so he showed that uh, star holds um, for some positive range of delta. So I th he showed it up to 1 over 16. The case of r equal 2 took another uh, few decades. So this is the work of uh, Duke Friedlander and Ivanich. Um, in some combination of these authors, roughly, roughly between 87 and 93, um, <clears throat> who showed for the case r equal 2 that this holds for some other range of delta. And it was only fairly recently that the case r equal 3 was understood. So this was uh, work of Rita, Rita Munshi. I think roughly um, four years ago. <clears throat> so he showed star uh, for a slightly weaker range, delta going up to 1 over um, 1612. 
which is a bit of a bigger denominator. And then he later improved that to um, 1 over uh, 308. <clears throat> so the interest in these problems came about um, in the first two cases from some classical questions they were connected to. So in the first case, uh, so the method used to show this, for example, when chi is a quadratic Dirichlet character, could shed a light on the problem of the least quadratic residue, non-residue modulo of that character. And in the case r equal 2, um, people understood that the motivating application was to understand distributions to integral solutions of the, uh, the sum of three squares equation. So these um, problems for r equal 3 and higher, so I'll mention r greater than or equal to 4, is uh, completely open in the uh, way I formulated it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that they've been motivated by representation, but we understand them as a, a, a technical problem in which to try to develop technique, which um, tests our understanding of automorphic forms, tests our understanding of Dirichlet characters, and which we can hope to apply to some other problems. Um, and that hope is not entirely So. <clears throat> Just to add a few adjectives um, regarding <clears throat> what these authors used. So DFI, I'll title this methods. So DFI used something um, that I'll describe a bit later called the delta symbol method, or just the delta method for short. <clears throat> which gives a, an analytic tool for detecting an identity between two integers, say m and n, a way to express that non-trivially, which one can then input into some other machinery uh, to attack this problem. So Munshi introduced another tool um, that people have come to call the GL2 delta symbol method, which involves some kind of unexpected, I think, application of the Peterson formula. And again, I'll explain that a bit later. Um, <clears throat> the reason I get interested uh, in the problem of understanding this method is because a couple years later, <clears throat> so Munshi, um, so he, annou he, he announced the proof a few years ago, and the preprint's been out since um, last April or so. So he proved an, an, an analogous subconvex bound for uh, a family of L functions that's been kind of um, at the center of a lot of interest for, for a couple dec decades now. So he proved a subconvex bound for uh, the L function attached to the symmetric square at 1 half um, for f, let's say, a weight 2 or any fixed weight cusp form on gamma naught of p, where p is a prime that goes to um, infinity. <clears throat> and so the proof used this, this chill do delta method um, as, as a second application going beyond his first application in the case of GL3 chi twists. So then I, um, about a, a little over a year ago, showed that um, uh, assuming the conclusion <clears throat> sim squared f bound, um, One gets uh, an analogous subconvex bound for uh, cuspidal twists so 
So here the picture is that phi is a, a fixed cusp form on GL2. And uh, f is as above. And if one takes these two um, conclusions together, this implies something known as a uh, strong arithmetic quantum unique ergodicity in this setting. So it says that uh, with notation as on the left board, uh, the Peterson inner products of f against uh, fixed test functions converge to uh, what they would if the function were uniformly distributed <coughs> as p goes to infinity, and moreover with a very strong rate, with the rate of p to the negative delta for all, say, um, fixed smooth functions on SL2z comma mod h. And some of these questions um, have been of a lot of interest for a while. And most of the methods we knew couldn't really make any dent on them. So I became very interested in understanding this GL2 de delta method that Munch introduced um, in either of these two examples. And given that this um, paper was, say, 70 pages, and um, this one was maybe 85 pages, it seemed natural to try to understand the published and perhaps slightly simpler case first. So what am I actually going to talk about today? <clears throat> so last summer, um, around June, so I learned that uh, Roman Holowinski was also interested in understanding this uh, delta symbol method a bit better in the case of GL3. So for example, he had given a topics course on it uh, for graduate students. And so we got together for a week and tried to understand it a bit better. And at the very least, we produced like a, a much conceptually simpler method that produces a stronger bound, which is um, simple enough that it can be explained in nine pages with full details. And uh, so I want to explain that today. Um, and what is the theorem? So the theorem of myself and Holowinski uh, we put it on the archive about a month ago. It says that um, for r equal 3, the bound that I wrote earlier, star, uh, holds for delta up to 1 over 36. <coughs> the emphasis here is not on the numerical improvement, but instead um, on the simplification of the method. So I'll I'll give the method a name just to refer to it later. I'll call it the h equals 0 method. So I'll explain how we get that. <clears throat> now I think this method that I'm going to explain is very imperfectly understood. For example, we have no way to know how to discover it yet without going through the details of Munchi's paper and trying to extract uh, some hints from there. <clears throat> so it'll be an interesting challenge for, for the speaker or perhaps the, the listener to try to find a more systematic way to discover what I'm about to describe. So are there any questions so far? How does this exponent 1 over 36 compare to the best bounds we have right now for the quadratic character? Do you know off the top of your head? Is that uh, they're much, worse? Uh, they're worse. Yeah. Okay. Quadratic character, maybe 1 over 8. Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So I want to describe um, for you some of the, uh, the inputs to the proof of the theorem that comes over there. And, and I'll assume that most of the listeners here, since this is a locally symmetric spaces seminar, aren't familiar with the standard tools. So the first 
standard step in the subject is uh, what's called an approximate functional equation. <clears throat> which roughly says that we can write the L value as uh, a finite sum of length roughly the, uh, the square root of q to the r. And I'll eventually take r equal to 3, but I'll write it in the general way for now. <clears throat> The precise meaning of the sums I'm writing is uh, that one puts in a smooth weight function that has the effect of cutting off the summation at the indicated upper bound. <clears throat> so the second input I want to mention is uh, the Voronoi summation type formulas. <clears throat> So these say, um, <clears throat> for example, uh, the following, that if you take n and you sum it, say, with a smooth dyadic weight over an interval of length n, the, uh, the function lambda of n, chi of n over n to the s, this is roughly given by um, a sum uh, over an interval of complementary length with respect to q to the r of lambda of n bar chi of n bar over, um, over square root of n together with the sign in front that comes from the sign in the functional equation. <clears throat> uh, there's, there's, there's no s anywhere because this is proved by um, applying Mellon inversion to the functional equation. Is there any S? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> So chi here is a primitive Dirichlet character modulo q, which you might think of as a large prime. And so by taking linear combinations for varying q um, gives a uh, formula for more general twists. <clears throat> I'll write the example that we'll actually need in just a second. <coughs> are, are lambda and the usually coefficients for, for pi? Or, uh, yeah. Okay. If I didn't uh, write that on the first board, so here. That's the definition of lambda n. Yeah. <clears throat> so an example of this uh, Voronoi formula that I alluded to, um, in the case r equal 3, uh, due to Miller and uh, Schmid, says, uh, let's say for a natural number c and for an invertible residue class, we can relate sums of lambda of n, and I'll define this notation in a second, ec of a n over uh, square root of n. This should be roughly the same as the sum of uh, lambda n bar over square root of n times a Klusterman sum. S of uh, A inverse and C divided by the square root of C, where the lengths of summation are as before. So let's say n is of size n here, and here n runs up to roughly q cubed divided by n. Whereas in 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll put a, a little notation uh, dictionary here in a second. <clears throat> So the so the notation uh, so I'll use um, e of x per e to the two pi i x. I'll use um, e c of a for e of a over c in the context over there where c is a natural number and a is a residue class and uh, s of let's say a b c will be the classical Klusterman sum. So we sum over invertible elements x modulo c of ec of x uh, a plus x inverse b. <clears throat> and we'll need one more analog. We'll need the twisted Klusterman sum modulo q. So this will be a sum as above of chi of x times the same coefficient as above this exponential factor. <laughs> okay, so I hope that clarifies the, the statement of the of the Voronoi formula in this case. <clears throat> so while we have the notation up, we're going to use another technique called reciprocity, which is a kind of mysterious technique that's appeared in a lot of these works. So in its basic form, it says that um, e of n is 1 for all integers um, n and z. And in a slightly more complicated um, application, it says that if you have co-prime natural numbers uh, q1 and q2, and let's say a is an integer, you can uh, write down a formula for the additive character modulo q1, q2 evaluated at a in terms of additive characters modulo the individual moduli, q1 and q2. This is something you can verify with the Chinese remainder theorem um, uh, pretty easily. And um, there, there are other ways to think of it. So the the important thing is that this function here, q1, q2 might be bigger than the individual factors. And this is also a function that's kind of an uh, Archimedean function of a. It's interpolated by a real analytic function. You can let a be any real number. So this you might think of it as, as an infinity attic uh, function, whereas um, this contribution here is, say, q1 attic. And this function here is, uh, is q2 attic. Another way to think of this, if you like, say, Adele's, is this is the product formula for the standard non-trivial character of Adele's mod q applied to the rational number a divided by q1, q2. And so I prefer to think of it. So you have, let's say q1 and q2 are distinct primes. You have, you have three interesting places going on, and using the product formula to swap frequencies from, say, two of them, them to some other two. So this will play an, impo an important role in, uh, in the argument. Um, as, as it has in some antecedent works in the literature, like there's a paper of Connor Ivanich and Xiaoxing Li, and uh, maybe many others. I don't know the history of applications of this uh, identity, but um, it seems surprisingly useful. Okay. So I don't, I don't want to write out a long proof and then get to the very end and say, oh, and then we apply character sum bound. So I, so I want to tell you now what we're actually just going to need so we can keep track of, um, of, of the input. So I'll write the character sum bounds we need. And maybe I'll just note these are kind of easy bounds. This is, I'm writing this just to kind of give a sense of what's actually uh, needed. So on the one hand. I'll call this lemma 1. We need the following sort of bound. Um, if you sum n over a dyadic interval that I'll say of length, length x, and maybe a, a good range would be something like, eh, well, some range x. 
Um, and you take Klosterman sums S of A1 and C1, S of A2 and C2. And you normalize the whole thing by the typical size of the Klusterman sums. And this is bounded by um, x divided by root c1, c2 plus root c1, c2. At least for, I'll just say, typical um, a1, let's say ai, and, uh, and cj. So there are some bad cases where this obviously does not produce cancellation when um, the square of C1 times A2 is the square of C2 times A1, for example. But outside of some kind of obviously bad cases, this is something we can estimate well. Okay. And if you're keeping track of how much algebraic geometry we need, this ends up boiling down to just when you expand everything out, yes. the ve bound for individual Klusterman sums. So you do the summation over n after you complete, and you get individual Klusterman sums again that you can um, bound. So that's actually the deepest result from algebraic geometry we'll need in the whole argument. So we'll need an another bound that I'll call limit 2 which is kind of interesting. It gives um, better than square root cancellation for twisted Klusterman sums. So um, I'll say this kind of in maybe the most um, su surprising form. So if you do the, the complete sum over n modulo q of the twisted Klusterman sum s chi of a1 n q s chi bar of a2 n q bar, divided by the thing that makes it um, roughly of size 1. So you can actually compute the absolute value of this. This is equal to, um, so it's a sum of q terms. It's of size q if a1 is congruent to a2 mod q. Now being a, su a sum of, um, that, now that's the case where everything is of basically size 1, so you get no cancellation. In the case when a1 and a2 are different, you might suspect you'd get square root cancellation in a sum like this. But actually, it re reduces to a modular, or sorry, to a Ramanujan sum. And you get much better than square root cancellation for this. So you can take this as an exercise to open the sums and change order of summation. Um, and you get this. And this is actually crucial to the argument. So if we, if we had put, say, q to the half here, instead of anything smaller, the, everything would fail. Um, and a corollary which I won't write is that we can do, say, a smooth sum over, say, some huge interval where completion will kill all of the non-zero frequencies of the same thing, and we'll get something small. What's that? Uh, yeah, chi is the chi is the chi from the from the beginning of the talk. Okay. So let's take a yeah. Thanks. All right, guys. Um, any questions on? Those inputs? OK. This one's also easy, you said? This one's also expanded? This one is completely elementary. elementary. So, it's, so it, it simplifies to a Ramanujan sum. Yep. So we remember that our goal is to prove the thing that I erased. And um, so what I'll do now is I'll talk a bit about the methods that we use, starting with the, the general um, method of amplification, at least in the first stage, kind of in the spirit of Duke, Friedlander, and Ivanich, but ultimately implemented somewhat differently. So let's suppose we're given um, some sequence of complex numbers. I'll call them gamma t, with the property that we um, if we sum gamma t against chi of t, we get 1. So maybe t is on some big dyadic interval, say, of size t. And gamma t is like 1 over t times the conjugate of the character. Just, but this is the property that'll matter. Um, so then we can write a character sum weighted by this lambda n as in the following form.
So I put chi of tn in the parentheses on the right. And um, so the, the identity is tautological. It uses that um, chi is a multiplicative function. <clears throat> And so we're going we're gonna to use this as in our basic setup. Um, this is the same setup, actually, that uh, Duke Friedlander and, Friedlander and Ivanich used in their argument. We're going to tweak it a little bit. Um, we're going to introduce another set of parameters. We're going to say like s of size s, uh, beta s, chi bar of s. We're going to have that equal to 1. And we're going to divide by s in that identity. And let's say that beta s is 0 whenever s is not coprime to q. Yeah, I think so. Let's put a sum over s. And the reason I've, 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 I've written it in the way I did is because the precise nature of the coefficients beta s and gamma t will play no role in the remaining argument. So having said something about the inputs and this basic technique, I'm going to take a moment to recall what the classical delta method looked like, just in one board. I'll explain what Munshi's GL2 delta method looked like. And then I'll explain what we do here with what I've called this h equals 0 method and how it uh, solves the problem in this case um, pretty quickly, given what we've um, summarized here. So the delta method, um, as, summer, as, as, as implemented by uh, Duke Friedel and Ivanich, arises as follows. So at the heart of their analysis, after doing something like on the right and some Cauchy shorts, our sums like the following. So they need to understand a sum over n of size roughly q of lambda of n times lambda of n um, plus q. And so this is the situation where we're on GL2. So r is equal to 2. And um, this is the typical sort of sum they need to analyze. So w we know nowadays many ways to attack this sort of sum. Um, for, for the GL3 analog, we're, we're somewhat more ignorant. But um, <coughs> the way they did it is the following. So if you stare at this at first, there's kind of no obvious way you can transform things. So you try introducing additional sums to mess things up a little bit, and then try doing something, and you hope that at the end of the day, um, something nice comes out. Now, this is my kind of naive, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the masters have better insight into um, how this uh, came about than I did. So the first thing they did is they, they write this as a sum over m and n of size q of lambda of n, lambda of n, delta function of m and n plus q. So that delta function means it's 1 if the two things are equal and it's 0 otherwise. OK. So then they use, well, I mean, you can always reduce to understanding delta of um, one argument against 0 by using subtraction. And then they derive the following uh, formula for, for the delta um, symbol. Um, so let's say fix a test function v maybe in cc infinity of um, some boring interval like 1, 2. And let's, um, let's take n, say, of size roughly n. And let's introduce a parameter r that I'll just, I'll just take to be square root of n, although you can argue a bit more generally. <clears throat> Consider the following sum. So let's sum over r the quantity um, v of r over r. And have in mind the range where n is going off to infinity. Okay. So it's pretty easy to work out what this sum should be asymptotic to. It's a Riemann, inter uh, it's a Riemann sum for the integral of v. So let's assume that, say, the integral of v is equal to, um, to 1, just for the sake of discussion. Then this sum is very, very closely asymptotic to just uh, r. OK? I'll leave, I'll leave a little more room um, here. Okay. 
So on the, on the other hand, you can you can rearrange this sum in some kind of um, novel ways. So you can rewrite it as um, v of zero over r divided by r, um, because we've assumed that v is supported away from zero. So v of zero is equal to zero. So this th the addition of this term does absolutely nothing. On the other hand, you can now introduce the parameter n, and if you put in the condition that r divides n, you get the same thing that I wrote before in the case that n is equal to 0, because in that case, the divisibility condition is empty. But on the other, on the other hand, if n is non-zero, you're summing over the divisors n of n, and r appears as a divisor precisely when n over r appears as a divisor. And so because we've taken a negative sign here, the two cancel out. And so we get um, a formula for delta of n0, which if you think a little bit, you, you can kind of see is like an application of Poisson summation. I mean, that's how you'd really um, analyze the asymptotics of this. And, and then to really, to really finish things off, they, they rewrite this divisibility condition as 1 over r times the sum over moduli of r, so a and z mod r of um, exponential modulo r of uh, a n. So that'll detect the divisibility condition. And this has the effect of expressing this delta symbol. Um, you can check pretty easily using the choice of v and the range of r that this forces r to be of size roughly root n. So you have about moduli of size root n, and residue classes modulo those. So in terms of about n functions, you root in the delta function on parameters of inputs of size about n, which is, which is not just such an unreasonable thing to expect because there are kind of n linearly independent functions in that space. Um, but it turns out to be the right decomposition or, or one possible decomposition for attacking this problem. And then they manipulate it further using the Voronoi summation formula that I mentioned at the beginning, among other techniques. So that's all I want to say about the delta method. Any questions on that? Uh, I don't see it. Uh, the sum over r, like this, if you expand an absolute values, you pick up all of the r's instead of the r's dividing n, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right. So yeah, so it seems like a very wasteful thing to do at the start. And where but, do you get but kind of, um, I mean, you, you do Voronoi on one of the sums, say the m sum, and then you get Klusterman sums when you execute this a sum, and then you apply the ve bound for those Klusterman sums. Okay. And then you can apply Kuznets all backwards, or you can do it all spectrally, which but turns out to be kind of. Sums, again... Yeah, so I mean, the, the, everything here can be kind of uh, interpreted, period, theoretically in some way. But um, yeah. Um, so this is, this is from 93. Uh, this was, um, and this is a much simpler way to prove these subconvex bounds than had, had existed um, in the earlier works. So I want to say just a word or two about this um, GL2 delta method of Munshi. Um, it had also been mentioned in like one of Ivanich's uh, textbooks, but not really uh, explained why uh, or what it might be good for. So, so, so Munshi's now proved at least two theorems that uh, really use this. So what's the idea? Um, so he wants to study, say, uh, the problem that we're going to prove a, a theorem about. So after this approximate functional equation I mentioned, we want to understand a sum like this, where the range of n is roughly q to the 3 halves. So one thing you can do is you can write this as a sum over, say, m and n, both of size n, of lambda of n times chi of n times the delta function of m and n. And then you can try to expand the delta function here again in some way that might magically do something for you. Um, so how does he choose to expand the delta function? Um, so let's recall roughly what the Peterson formula looks like. So it says if you average over, let's say, um, cusp forms f on GL2, and you take their Fourier coefficients, so maybe they're, maybe they're holomorphic forms in some um, space, and be divided by an adjoint L value. So this should equal, after you get the normalization right, um, the delta function of mn plus some sum of Klusterman sums. So sum of smnc 
over C times some Bessel function Jmn over C squared. And I won't recall the exact normalization, but um, you can see the delta function appears on the right-hand side, um, kind of miraculously and in a somewhat fragile way. So this is the this is say the Peterson formula for maybe holomorphic forms. And if you take the if you take the Churikus Netzel formula, including the Moss forms as well, uh, the delta symbol disappears, and so this formula would be would be useless for the task at hand. Um, so, this is, so for some reason, that's structurally I think not at all clear. Um, Expanding the delta symbol in this problem in this way, and then analyzing the contribution of this sum and this sum plugged in there, dualizing everything in sight repeatedly, you know, like you have like 18 transformations over some 70 pages, uh, actually produces a, a good bound in the end. Um, and, and the complexity of the argument is, I think, quite large and hard to grapple with. So uh, somewhat, large, somewhat longer than the DFI argument I indicated above. So I mean, this, this somehow comes from like, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the singularity near the um, degenerate uh, cell in G mod N mod yeah. N that produces this, right? So if you take a nice test function on G that's supported away from the identity oh, and transforms, then yeah. <clears throat> So somehow that singularity that you know is always annoying when you're trying to do these, um, you know, expansions uh, is responsible for this working. And I'm I'm simplifying a bit. I mean, he actually takes several instances of the Peterson formula for different levels and characters, averages all of them together, and then produces a delta symbol method that way. Okay. So now um, I'm just going to talk about how we actually prove this theorem, replacing his delta symbol method by this h equals 0 method. I don't mean to over, I mean, <coughs> just giving it a name for now. I don't know that this is a great name. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all we got left. OK. Okay, so um, <clears throat> hopefully this explanation will clarify the um, the origin of the name. So I don't know. Let's again fix a nice uh, function v as on the previous board, and let's consider uh, the following sum. So we can take a sum over r, um, the function v, uh, say of r, and we can write down the Poisson summation formula. Let's have a little more room. <clears throat> so the Poisson summation formula says we get the sum over um, the Fourier transform at integers h. Okay. And we can we can rescale it by dividing this by r, dividing this by r, and then dividing this by uh, one over r. It remains a valid formula. So r will be some parameter our, our, at our disposal here. Um, let's normalize this before so that v hat of 0 is equal to 1. Um, so we're going to use a twisted Poisson summation formula, modulo q, the conductor of the character under consideration. So the way to prepare to state that is the following. We can, we can rewrite this form in the following way. Um, so take the sum a priori over. Um, h and qz, put this um, q there, and then put an e of eq of uh, hr here. And then divide h by q again. So this is, this is, this is a rewriting of the formula from before. Um, the virtue of writing in the way I have is that now we can in insert arbitrary uh, functions of r mod q on both sides, and it remains a valid identity the way I've written it. So the function of r mod q that we'll insert will be the, the character chi of r times the additive character um, eq of u divided by r. Let's assume we're in a range where r is always co-prime with q. Maybe q is prime and r is smaller. 
And here, um, E will be an arbitrary residue class modulo Q. OK. We'll insert the corresponding thing on the, um, on the right-hand side. So um, here we'll get chi of R um, E Q of U divided by R. And I guess the, the, the character chi forces us to be invertible here um, anyway. So that's OK. OK. Um, let's tweak this a little bit. Let's put a Q to the half here. Let's renormalize this to Q to the half. And let's um, notice that this, the sum I got over here is just this twisted Klusterman sum that we started the talk um, defining. OK. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to split off the contribution from h equal to 0 on the right-hand side. So that'll give us an additional term of, well, v hat of 0, which we normalized to be 1, plus um, 1 over q to the half s chi of 0, u, and q. And you can convince yourself pretty easily that this is just a, a Gauss sum multiplied by um, chi of u. So it's a Gauss sum for, uh, for chi bar. So denoting by um, epsilon chi bar, the normalized Gauss sum of size 1, we'll just get chi of u up to something understandable uh, from the h equals 0 contribution. OK. And so naturally, we can view this as a formula for the character chi. Um, now, I, now, I have no understanding of how one could have, say, discovered that something like this would be useful. And if anyone has a suggestion, that would be, uh, that'd be very welcome. Typical ranges. Um, yeah, let's, let's start an index of parameters. Why don't we? Um, <clears throat> Maybe I'll put it here. Um, so n is q to the three halves, let's say, and in that case, r will be q to the two thirds. S will be. This is unfortunate. Q to the two eighteenths. And uh, t will be q to the 5 over 18. And unfortunately, I'm not aware of like simpler fractions that would also get the job done where I'd present them. Um, so uh, we'll do our best. OK. Um, so now we're kind of in good position to substitute the formula up here into the formula down here, and to apply the, pr the preliminaries we've uh, developed throughout the talk. So let's take this formula with u equal to um, tn divided by s, as suggested by the argument on the right-hand side over there. And so then this tells us that we can write, um, let's say the normalized sum, n of size n of um, lambda n chi of n as, uh, well, this unimportant Gauss sum sign times some expressions that I'll call f and o for historical reasons related to Munchi's work mentioned before. So f will be the contribution from um, the left-hand side of this formula for chi. And o will be the contribution from the right-hand side of this formula. Okay. Then we're going to prove some bounds for, um, for f and l. <clears throat> so I guess I've left that up. So that's, um, that's good. <clears throat> Let's start by talking about uh, f. So f, just to, just to write it, I'm going to introduce a little notation for this function here. I'll call it alpha r. So its precise shape won't matter uh, from here on. So f we can write as um, q to the 1 half over n sum over r s t of these unimportant coefficients 
times the sum over n of size uh, n of lambda n e uh, q, copying from right here, of uh, tn over rs. <clears throat> so now we execute one of the tricks I mentioned earlier, which is this reciprocity um, formula. It tells us that we can rewrite this expression as <clears throat> e rs of negative tn over q um, times, and I'll write it above just to give my, myself a little room, um, e q r s of tn. <clears throat> By what I called reciprocity. Now the parameters that I wrote over here have been chosen carefully so that we have um, the following identity, uh, qrs equals um, tn. The significance of this identity is that this um, function here is essentially constant on the ranges of the variables under consideration. So we can absorb it into the implicit weight function and get rid of it. Okay. So next we're going to apply this Voronoi summation formula that I've written above here, taking for C the modulus, the new modulus Rs of the sum here. Okay. So we can see from this board what this will transform everything to. <clears throat> so um, by Voronoi, <clears throat> so f will now equal, um, again, a sum, uh, something like this, and then um, We'll have an rs cubed over n factor coming in times a sum over r, s, and t of alpha r, beta s, uh, gamma t, a sum over n of size n, um, lambda n bar. And then in place of this exponential, we'll have a Klusterman sum uh, s of, say, um, q over t n r s divided by square root of rs. OK. And then to bound this last expression, we just do the following. Um, we apply Cauchy-Schwartz to get rid of the lambda and write it as a sum over n and r on the outside with the sum over s and t on the inside of um, the expression that, that is left here. <clears throat> and then we apply what I called lemma 1 um, earlier in the talk. So lemma 1 says that after you open the square and execute the n sum, you get good cancellation between uh, two of these, provided you're in a uh, configuration where you don't obviously not get cancellation. Ah. Uh, using just Bay or Poisson summation or using special? So lemma one uses Poisson summation to just to complete the sum. And then it simplifies to the Bay bound for Klusterman sums. Okay. That's, the, yeah, that's the ultimate input. So I, so I won't write the bound we get, but um, that, that ends up being an adequate bound for f. And it's, it's pretty easy to, to analyze. Um, and I guess I'll just say what we do for O. Um, well, O, as you see, will be a sum over R, S, T, and H. What's that? No, they reflect um, just the two sides of this 
I, I, I don't know if a good way to um, philosophize about. Uh, so, so F, the, uh, the nomenclature comes from Munshi's paper, where F comes from the Fourier side with the Fourier coefficients. We usually have this delta symbol expressed backwards. Yeah. And, Right, so, so, so he says the off-diagonal in the Peterson formula, I'll call the off-diagonal for my purposes. And so we're, I mean, we're naming it because it has a similar structure to what comes up in his proof, but not for any um, good reason that I know of. Um, so I'll take 20 seconds just to say what um, we do with O. So O squared, we again get rid of lambda. And we can bound it by a sum over n and a sum over h, s, and t of what's left. And then to this, we apply what I called uh, lemma 2. Lemma 2 said that you got better than square root cancellation when you had a, a correlation between sums of the shape. OK. And so um, I mean, if you guys want, I can write the final bounds, but maybe that's not um, the most interesting uh, thing to do. And then you do some arithmetic, and you end up getting um, that f squared plus uh, o squared is bounded by q to the negative 1 over 18, which translates to the 36 that we had um, before squared. Now, um, there are many natural questions here. So, so I think most importantly, how in the world could one have systematically discovered what we have here without, say, plowing through Munchi's paper and trying to extract some sort of hint at what structure might be there? Um, like, what's the science explaining this method, explaining the DFI method? Uh, how, do, how, how do we understand the limitations of these methods? How do we discover new ones in different contexts? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there are, more, there are more interesting questions like, um, can one apply this to a GL3 times GL2 situation? Can one do something like it on GL4? I mean, I mean, perhaps not. But um, and, and, and I mean, I mean, for me, of course, I was motivated, as I indicated at the beginning, by the symmetric square application of Munshi. And so the big question is whether one can find an analogous uh, argument that substitutes for his use of the Peterson formula in that treatment. Um, yeah. So, so, so in summary. Um, uh, my, my goal for you know, something over a year has been to try to understand this um, GL2 del delta symbol method uh, a bit more clearly. Um, and so, so perhaps finding a simpler treatment in this one case represents some partial progress towards uh, understanding that better. And um, yeah, still working on it. Any ideas would be, would be very welcome. So thanks. <clears throat>